so uh, let me begin with this question right here for tonight. So, dear Rabbi, I was at the funeral of Zaidi Efun this week, and I noticed that family members and friends were called forward to fill in the grave with earth. What is the reason for this? Who are the appropriate people to participate? So I'm sure you've all seen that at funerals in which uh, the rabbi usually asks the people to go and fill in the grave with earth and you take a shovel, you pour it, uh, you pour some of the earth inside. And then when you, once you're done, you put the shovel back on the floor or in the earth and you don't hand it over to someone uh, because you are showing as uh, this, this sign of reluctance that you really don't want this, you're not, you know, you're not completely, you haven't made peace yet with the fact that this person died and therefore you are uh, uh, demonstrating some reluctance by just putting it back and not giving it to someone else. By the way, that sign of reluctance is also, also shown when one pours the earth. When one pours the earth, usually the custom is to turn the shovel around so that you don't take earth from the inside of the shovel as you would usually do but rather from the outside of the shovel, also showing that you're re reluctant to do this. But the question is, of course, why do we do this? Uh, what's this Jewish custom all about? So we believe that it's connected to the general idea that the ultimate act of kindness we can do is kindness towards that, those that are deceased. Why? Because those that are deceased can't really pay us back for the, for the kindness that we did to them. So we are doing this type of kindness and that kindness is as altruistic as it could be. Because again, we can't be doing this to get something back in return. There is no person that's alive that can give us back something in return. So it's called chesed shalemet. Now, therefore we escort the dead. Therefore it's a very big mitzvah uh, to go to a funeral. Therefore it's a big mitzvah to also comfort the dead. Uh, comfort the, the mourners, sorry, uh, that are mourning the dead. Now, um, one of those, those uh, items of chesed shalemet, of this kindness of truth, is to build a, a resting place for the deceased. And when we pour in this earth, we're participating in the building of this resting place for the deceased. Now, that's really what this Jewish custom is based on. I do want to add that I do believe that it's it's in in a very bizarre way. I, I do believe that it's uh, um, brilliant psychologically. In a way, I think it's quite therapeutic, because the first stage, as we all know, of any type of tragedy is denial, and uh, the second stage is when acceptance begins. Now, very often when such a the tragedy happens, then we're in denial. And yet Judaism comes and tells the family members and the friends too, you know what, take some earth and pour it in. Start the acceptance stage. Let, don't dwell too much in the denial. That's not good for you. It's not good for your state of mind. Start the acceptance stage as painful as it may be. Accept the fact that the person has passed, pour some earth on the coffin and, um, and transition to that acceptance stage. So I, I do think it's also quite therapeutic. Um, I just want to add one more thing, since you did mention that indeed this, uh, you saw this custom at Zaidi Efyun's funeral. So just in his loving honor, uh, Zaidi Efyun, as many of you know, was an integral part of the greater Jewish community, um, the greater Phoenix Jewish community. He's the father of Hilton Efyun, who comes every single Shabbat here to CBT. The grandfather also of Daniel and Brad and Ryan and uh, other members of CBT too. But Zaidi Efyun was known and apparently throughout the Shiva, many, many, many stories came out about Zaidi was known uh, for his giving. I think it's no coincidence that his name was Natan, Nathan. Natan in Hebrew means to give. And he did, he did not stop giving. No matter the mood he was in, no matter the place he was in, Wherever he, wa he was with, he gave. He gave a smile. He gave a lending, uh, a lending hand. He gave just his mere presence. And uh, he gave a hug. He gave a good word. That was his passion, to give and give, give, give all the time. He would make friends with cashiers in supermarkets. The manager of his bank called uh, this. I just heard tonight, I was visiting the family. The manager of the bank called to tell the manager of the bank is an Indian man, not Jewish, 
and he called to tell his wife how deeply touched he was by Nathan because one day he came to the bank and he noticed that the clock that he had, that this manager had on his desk was broken. So he said to the manager, why do you have a broken clock on your um, desk? He said, well, it's broken, I haven't fixed it yet. Nathan took it, went to the clock doctor here in Scottsdale, fixed it for him and brought it back. Now the manager of the bank tells his wife, I think of your husband every day. I see the clock, I think of him every day. Simple act of kindness, but not an act of kindness, unfortunately, that many people would have thought of. And, and, but here was a man who was obsessed with giving and gave no matter what, it was never about him, it was always about what he can do for you. And it's something to, be, to, to learn from, really. I mean, if, if, I know that it's hard for us to do that 100% of the time like Zaidi, but we can do it maybe 50% of the time with 50% of the people we meet or 25% of the people we meet. But imagine how better our world would be if we each took upon ourselves to make it a point to make someone smile. No matter who that someone is, it might be someone we just bumped into at the gas station, a cashier or a bank manager. Imagine if how the world would look like if we made it a point to help someone with a tiny little clock that's broken or with that even may be, but maybe they need a little bit of help. Maybe they need a little bit of, of love. Imagine if we could all be Zaydis, I think the world would be so much brighter and better. So that's really loving memory of Zaydi that was quoted here in this question. All right, next question. So. Uh, Rabbi, can I ask a quick question about yeah, sure. giving? Um, isn't it a custom to also uh, have us, uh, dirt from Israel to put in the, in the grave? Yeah, there is a custom like that, that's correct. Some put it in the grave, some put it inside the casket before the casket is closed. The idea, that's a different, different idea. That, that really is based on the idea that we really believe it's one of the 13 principles of faith in Judaism that the dead will be resurrected and uh, they will be resurrected in the land of Israel. So we add a little um, land from Israel, a little soil from Israel so that they wouldn't have to roll all the way to Israel and then resurrect from there, but they could be resurrected from where they are buried because again, they have this land of Israel with them. So it will be considered as if they are resurrecting from the land of Israel. That's Thank you. the holistic idea behind that. Thank you for the question. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Rabbi, yes. I, I, it's reminding me of a question. When I bring books from the library that we were uh, getting rid of, the Bibles and things um, that we're not, we were not going to keep, I brought them to the cemetery and, and uh, the one that's up north of me. And um, the, the man was saying that there are people today who want to be buried on a lying on a book of Bibles or a few Bibles. I, I didn't question him, but have you ever heard of that? No, I never heard of that. I do, uh, the only thing I ever heard of is the Jewish custom, which is quite prevalent, <clears throat> to be buried with a mitzvah that you did all the time, like the talit. And the reason for that is so that it serves as your advocate as you, as you transition to the heaven. But to be buried on Bibles, never heard of such a thing. This is a, the Jewish cemetery. It's not anybody else's. It's right. all Jewish. Yeah. I just wondered. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I told him he could use it yeah. for whatever he wants to. Otherwise, they bury them. You know. Yeah, they bury them. That's because, again, they're holy books. So we can't yeah. treat them like garbage, right? Right. But I said, right. do what you will feel. <laughs> right. I don't know. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Okay. So next question here. Uh, it's kind of a personal question, but I'm going to relate to it nonetheless because it speaks to to a Jewish idea. So, dear Rabbi Mazel Tov, on the birth of your daughter Adina, thank you. Someone asked me who the original Adina was. Mm. I had no idea what to answer. Is it a biblical name? I don't remember hearing of an Adina in the Torah. So, where is her name actually from? So, it's a good question. Adina, I made the research before. My wife and I made the research before naming our daughter Adina. First, our daughter Adina was named after uh, our beloved mentor and teacher, Rabbi Dean Steinzeltz, Evan Israel of Blessed Memory, who passed away just a few months ago. But the name Adina also stems from uh, the Torah. Now, it's true that her name is not in the Torah, but it is a name of that same era, of the era of the Torah. Which era in the Torah? It's the era of... Rebecca, Rebecca, who became 
really uh, the wife of Isaac and the mother of Jacob, who then fathered the Jewish people, the 12 tribes and the Jewish people. Now, uh, why is she connected to Rebecca? Because Adina was Rebecca's mother. Mm. The Midrash tells us that uh, although Rebecca's father, Laban, was an evil man, as the Torah demonstrates with his lust for uh, stealing and all sorts of bad things, and his comportment also towards Jacob later on, and I cheated him and so on. But her father, uh, sorry, her mother, Adina, was the most righteous woman. And in fact, Rebecca, who was a righteous woman too, was righteous because of the education of her mother, of uh, Adina, because of the education, the devotion, the love, the care, and the upbringing that she gave her, that Adina gave her daughter, uh, Rebecca. So that's who the original Adina was. Now, just to add to that, Adina also means gentle. Now, uh, apparently she was very gentle too. Uh, that's why the name Adina, but gentle doesn't mean that she was frail or that she was weak. Mm -hmm. Gentle might mean in her comportment and her behavior, the way she dealt with people. You always have to be gentle as uh, the ethics of our fathers teach us that one should always be uh, gentle, sever panemia fort, smiling to people. Uh, but inside she had this very, um, very, uh, deep strength of character and of morals and of values, uh, covered, of course, by this layer of uh, gentleness to be able to convey those morals in the most gentle way as one is supposed to. But she was gentle with the component and with her relations to others. Um, nonetheless, again, she was steeped in this very strong uh, anchor of Judaism, of her heritage, which enabled her to then uh, raise a Rebecca that eventually changed the world. So that was uh, who Adina was. Okay, next question right here. So um, here's the question. When does one repeat a bracha, a blessing? For example, when we make kiddush on wine and then at dinner, we pour a glass of wine with the meal. Do we say the blessing over the wine again? What about if we are having a cup of coffee and we say the blessing, it sits and it gets cold and we reheat it or pour another cup. Is another bracha required? Is another blessing required? I'm sure there are many other examples as well. So good question. When do we have to repeat a blessing over food? So the idea is this, and that's, that's really the, the, uh, the major guide uh, to, this, to this question to enable us how, how to conduct ourselves and how to proceed. If while saying a blessing, I have the intention to continue on that eating or drinking that particular food during the meal, then if I've said that blessing with that intention, then I don't need to say the blessing each time I eat from that, from that food or drink from that drink, because again, it was connected, those multiple eatings or drinkings were connected to my initial intention while saying that initial blessing. If I had uh, just the cup that I'm drinking from in mind, and I had no idea that I was gonna drink another cup of wine, of water, whatever it may be during the meal, I had therefore no intention of including those cups in my initial blessing, then yes, I should say a blessing again when I have that cup of wine eventually, because again, it wasn't included in my initial, in the intention of my initial blessing. So that is really the golden rule. And that's true for Kiddush, it's true. If I did not know that I was going to have wine during the meal, I didn't have that in mind. And all of a sudden wine is served to me, even though I said Bori Pura Geffen over Kiddush, I have to say Bori Pura Geffen again. Same with uh, any other type of food. Now, you ask a good question about coffee. So I will say this, that there is, about coffee, tea, any hot drinks, there is the whole halachic argument whether one should say a blessing over them altogether. Another Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, for example, the, the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel of blessed memory, he held that one should not say a blessing over coffee, over tea. Why? Because it's impossible to have coffee in one shot. It's too hot. So really you're not drinking the coffee, you're sipping the coffee, you're tasting the coffee. So you can't say a blessing that refers to drinking when you're actually just sipping, you're tasting. 
So maybe one shouldn't say a blessing altogether because it's not considered drinking. You do this every few minutes, so you're not, you're not drinking. So that was his opinion. And it's, a, it's just an interesting opinion to note. Not everyone agrees with that opinion. I personally do say a blessing, even though, you know, uh, because I follow Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, who's another Sephardic chief rabbi, who said that, yes, you should. Now, uh, that's regarding hot drinks. Now, because, of course, when you say the blessing initially over coffee, if you are of the opinion to say a blessing over coffee, unlike Rabbi Ovadi Yosef has mentioned, then, of course, when you say the blessing, you are saying the blessing over the entire cup of coffee. And therefore, you don't need to say a blessing each time you take a sip, even though there may be some long intervals between each and every sip. But that's something to, to keep in mind also. Okay. So that's to relate to that question. Um, next question, and I believe this is the last one for tonight, and then we'll open this up. So, dear Rabbi, I know you read a psalm for your dear beloved mentor, Rabbi Adin Evan Israel, Steinsaltz of Blessed Memory. I would like to do the same for my daughter, Jennifer, of Blessed Memory, if appropriate. I would like to know the reasoning behind doing this, and if I remember correctly, the psalm is the number they would have been following the death. Is this something done daily and for how long? Is it done just for the year following the death or does the Psalm change every year? Okay, so that's, that's an excellent question. So indeed, there is a custom to recite the Psalm of those that are deceased and also those that are living. It doesn't have to be just the deceased. I say the Psalms of my children every day and that takes me quite a while, <laughs> Baruch Hashem, because I have numerous children. But it can be of the living too, not just of the deceased. Usually the psalm that corresponds to each and every person is the psalm uh, that, um, of, that totals the number of their age. So if my son, for example, one of my son is uh, 15 years old, so I would say Psalm 16 because he's in his 16th year of life. Mm -hmm. Now, we do the same with the deceased. So Rabbi Steinsaltz would have been right now 83. So we say 84. After his uh, 84th birthday, or 80, yeah, after, you know, when we celebrate his 84th birthday, even though he's deceased, then we'll say 85. Then we'll say 86 for his, after his 85th birthday and so on and so forth. So we do the same with the deceased. And that's the sum that corresponds again, either to the living or to the dead. It's a beautiful custom for multiple reasons. <clears throat> Reason number one, because as one of the great Hasidic masters taught, we underestimate the power of Psalms. If we knew the power of Psalms, as he said, we would say Psalms all day long because Psalms have the power to break the gates of heaven open and really bring about all the blessings that we, that we desire. Not all the time, but many, many, many times. When we say a, a Psalm on behalf of someone, then it brings down blessings for that someone, whether they're alive or not. It brings nachas to the soul, it brings elevation to the soul and joy to the soul for they deceased. And if they're alive, it brings them blessings in this world too. That's number one. Number two, I also do believe that very subtly it, it creates a connection between us and the one we're saying a psalm, uh, uh, the one we're saying the psalm of. Now that connection is a connection then that I think betters or maybe even deepens the relationship. By me saying Psalms, the Psalms of my children, <clears throat> whether they feel it or not, I know that on the spiritual level, it tightens my bond with them. It, it brings me closer to them. And that in and of itself is worth saying Psalms of people that we love, the people that we are close to. And I say this the, for the same reason, I say the Psalm of my rabbis on a spiritual level, I know that by thinking about him and speaking about him, it, it, it deepens my connection with him even more. So that's a deeper reason of why uh, this Jewish custom. I'll add just one more thing. And that is that the Talmud says, Rahmana libabai, which means that God wants the heart. And I don't think there is any purer and therefore any more effective prayer than Psalms that are recited with a pure heart, with a complete heart, maybe even sometimes with a broken heart and some tears. These type of psalms are psalms that, again, bring about all of the blessings. And that's why the Baal Shem Tov would encourage people to recite psalms all the time. 
and he would also extol the, 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 the high level of even the most simple Jew, the simplest Jew, who maybe doesn't know much Torah, and doesn't even know how to perform mitzvot, but he, he says Psalms, and he would say that just by saying those Psalms, the simplest Jews are a higher level and even the most learned. Of course, he was vilified because of saying that, Baal Shem Tov, founder of the Hasidic movement. Those who were, uh, you know, scholars and so on didn't like that. What a simple Jew is better than me. But that's the truth. That's the truth. So whether we consider ourselves scholars or not, and great people or not, those Psalms can elevate us and can elevate our stature in front of God and in a way can bring about many, many, many blessings. If they are said with a pure heart, then there's no limit to what these Psalms can truly achieve for us and for the world.